In today's video, part one of our series on the future of corporate social responsibility, you'll learn how the CSR profession has changed. We discuss its history, how the profession looks today, and how it will evolve in the future. Let's make a social impact. Hi everyone, I'm Carl. Welcome to The Social Impact Show, a channel where you get the latest strategies and tips to help you scale and grow your CSR and goodness programs. So today, my guest, you've probably seen her before, uh, Nicole McPhail, welcome back to the show. She is the managing partner of Social Impact and co-founder of Darwin Pivot. Thank you very much, Nicole, for coming back. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. So, Nicole, we're going to be talking about how the corporate social responsibility professional has changed. But before we get into that, maybe we can or you can kind of go through the history of um, the role itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. this. CSR became more formalized uh, back, you know, in the 80s and 90s or so when companies were really trying to basically have the right to operate certain um, certain communities, I guess. And so um, there were more informal relationships made with not-for-profits and those organizations, but they were traditionally sort of led by someone at the top that's just building these relationships and then they're you know, sending out money to causes that kind of made sense to them. And so the campaign um, model came in you know, a little bit later and that's with United Way. And uh, this was a little bit more structured and formalized, but it was basically an administrator who was processing um, employee donations that were being made on behalf of the company to United Way organizations. And so that was a very administrative burden um, on just someone who had nothing to do with CSR. And I think they were basically just like checking the box to get it done. And so as we move on um, to, you know, cause marketing that happened like this is actually in the 90s. And sorry, I misspoke that sort of informal giving was happening way back in the 50s. Uh, cause marketing sat more in maybe a marketing team and it was 100% around how you can build up your brand just by doing good in the communities. And that would that's where the CSR role sort of sat at that point. And so when we furthered on, then we were looking at sort of the employee engagement model in combination with strategic grants that were being donated and giving out. And that's when um, I think a lot of companies started to realize we needed someone more focused on this type of work. And what better type of person than people that understand the employee base, um, but also can build those relationships in the communities. So the role looks a little bit different at that point based on the company that you're in, um, whether you fall within HR and you're just a program manager that's also doing CSR, or if you, you know, actually fit on a philanthropy team, it really depended on um, where that company's CSR strategy started in the first place. And so now this is where we're at. And I might pause there because I think that's kind of where, where you were hoping to go next. Yeah. When it, I think before we get into that, though, it's, it's interesting how it started purely as administrative, but then people started realizing that role. When did you, when did you think like, it became an, maybe the national consciousness um, or international consciousness, I guess, that like this role isn't just somebody who takes dollars or, or just works on a spreadsheet. Although I, I would I would argue a lot of social impact professionals still work on spreadsheets, yeah. but today, like that that was just it was just sort of like at the side of their desk and it wasn't focused on social impact. It was just, oh, it was like an administrative, this is how much this person gave at this time, at, and this is the amount? So I think I would guess that the value of CSR was starting to get recognized once um, the cause marketing came into play. And so, you know, wait, should we invest more money when we are seeing financial benefits of giving back to communities? And then it began to grow from there. So then when we think about, okay, wait, employee engagement is pretty important. Turnover costs a lot of money. Can we do something in, in and around this area to be able to attract and retain talent through these types of programs? Because people are kind of hardwired to do good. Um, and generosity makes you happier, less depressed, all of those things. So this is the type of people and or programs that they want in their companies. And so I think what happened at, around that point is people realize, okay, well, there might be something here that looks inauthentic that's not good and employees are saying we want this we we care about these programs and they have to be authentic we won't buy from companies that aren't operating in that way and we don't want to work for them either so i feel like that's when the te the 
the tail started to wag the dog a little bit, so to speak, where the consumers and, and employees were starting to drive the behaviors around CSR within the companies. And that's like just happening now. So this is the first time in history that I've personally seen, and I've been doing this for 15 years, a lot more companies standing up and doing things for the right reasons, rather than foundation boards just doing it because they have a, you know, a financial duty to do so. Got it. So let's move forward then to what the social impact responsibility professional looks like today. Like, what does that role look like? Yeah, and I think that this is sort of the the product of some of those things I was just mentioning. Like there's um, there's been, the people are speaking. The people really want this sort of more purpose-filled, authentic place. And um, this is also happening on the tails, or actually we're still in the midst of the great resignation. So companies really have to think about who they are as a company and purpose is becoming front and center. And what purpose means it varies, I guess, for a lot of companies, but you think of it from who you are as a company and how someone can align with that brand. And I'd say, arguably, this is how leadership is setting the stage for who they are. And this could mean as a, a corporate citizen and how they operate, um, as well as how you are making people feel with, about the work they're doing. Is it purpose-filled? And then also how you're thinking about supporting them as individuals for showing up at work. And this can come from some of the employee giving and volunteering programs and things like that. And so when you think about the CSR practitioner, we aren't just thinking about executing out on the, you know, transactional programs anymore, we have to be a lot more strategic about where we are bringing purpose to the table and how we're infusing this in all three of those aspects of purpose that I just mentioned, which is like who we are as a company. So advising um, executives on what that actually means and how they can do this with the decisions that they make, the vendors that they partner with, how they hire, all of that stuff. Um, to the way that someone feels about their role. You can infuse purpose and authenticity and a whole bunch of pieces, even CSR aspects to the way that someone is operating. And then the programs and the support and the ethos and all of those things from the employee level, not just about them at work, but also extending to how they can involve and role model to um, involve their family and role model to their children and people that they, they you know, engage with from the day to day. So how have the, I guess the roles that I also see now, so for example, diversity, equity, inclusion, sustainability, I see a lot of people with different titles, yet there's a lot of overlap with a social impact pro, right? And what I've, I've also noticed, like just in, in conversation, people are doing different things in different companies. So it doesn't seem like there's a standardized, well, here's the, I'll take it, communications. Here's the internal communications team or person. Here's the external communications team or person. And generally people know what the internal comms person does, the external comms person does. They know what the software engineer does, um, varying on different companies. But it seems that from social impact, there's a lot of different moving parts or or roles haven't been like de defined. Like how how would you how would you describe that? You're bang on. And so when I was talking about sort of the social impact role now, that's and maybe I was over speaking in that that's where it's going. That sort of like there, there's a lot more emphasis put on that sort of holistic perspective on purpose as a whole, um, especially with some of the new standards around ESG and things like that. Like there's new obligations of social impact practitioners, but to your point, um, there is a, a huge variety in terms of how companies actually structure their program. And a lot of it has to do with that journey that I talked about in the beginning, which is why they have the program in the first place. And not everyone is going to be over here at purpose. Some people might still be doing, you know, just a United campaign way campaign every year. So we've got everything in between. And then the way that the professional comes in, the social impact or CSR professional comes in is based on that. So, you know, if you're reporting to legal, because that's the reason why you have the program in the first place, it's like sort of checking the box your the way you're running your programs the way that you're thinking about the work is going to be different than say a company that came in and said you know what let's build this from scratch let's design for x and then hire the appropriate team to accomplish it so that's why you're going to see different titles like 
corporate citizenship, CSR, social mm -hmm. impact. Some companies are thinking more outwardly. So often if you see like a head of social impact, they're really thinking a lot more about like external partnerships and long-term relationships that they can um, set and measure change and impact over time. Uh, employee engagement around CSR is more around employee programs, which are like just, you know, getting people involved and tracking it based on how many people in their company are participating. So you're going to see everything in between. But I think, you know, if, if you're looking into getting into CSR, I would say be the person that creates what it should be rather than just following along because it's always been that way. And sometimes I think social impact practitioners or CSR people feel handcuffed to the way it was versus really thinking strategically about where it should be. You know, I, I know I've done so many different interviews asking the question about how do you get leadership buy-in um, from your organization? Now, I, I also haven't heard or haven't seen very much where the social impact professional, ESG, DEI, and I, all those different roles have actually a seat at the table, the prover proverbial table, where there's a, an actual executive level person. And maybe there are one or two or a couple in, in bigger organizations, but I haven't really seen that. Is that something that the practice is moving towards or we're still maybe a couple decades away? Yeah, I think that there's a very small amount of companies that actually are closer to that point. Um, and these are when the CSR leader is reporting to the CEO. That is the best place you can be. Um, and I think that's a dream for most CSR people. So right now it is about the relationships and making sure that you find yourself in the right business unit that makes sense for what you're trying to do with your program. So obviously the CEO is a really great spot to be, but I would say, you know, um, if you could get in human resources, you might be able to have more flexibility over people programs, which is pretty important. Um, but it really does depend on your company about you know how you're going to gain that access. But I think the big thing for getting buy-in isn't necessarily just having a seat at the table. It's how you know how to position the value of the work that you're doing. And that, again, aligns heavily to what it is you're solving for in the first place. So for instance, if you're solving for consumer brand, um, you need to talk about the fact that you know people are belief-driven buyers. You need to have data points on how consumers make decisions and how important it is to be doing these authentic things in your communities. If you're solving for employee engagement, you can need to talk about you know the multi, the five generations that make up the workforce and how you need to have flexible programs that will make sure that you retain your people. And many of them, especially after, after the Great Resignation, are rethinking what purpose means, what they want to do for their communities, and the companies need to be there, I guess, holding their hands along that the way. So, you know, some companies are solving for all of these things, and that's great too, but you just need to really understand that value proposition and do that research first to build the case and then to build those relationships. And then all of a sudden, you're you're making a lot more traction. Isn't it a bit of a danger? Because I know you mentioned one of the dreams would be to um, report directly to the CEO. But isn't there a danger that if you are reporting to the CEO or this is sort of a initiative driven by the CEO, if that CEO leaves and a new CEO comes, isn't the program kind of dependent on one person rather than it's an established, like, I guess, a fact in the organization? It could be. Um, and I think the the way to get ahead of that is it don't, don't base your program and only have the CEO making decisions. The CEO is just someone that becomes an advocate for you. So when the CEO buys in, then um, you can get additional buy-in from other executives and then functions within the organization. So if you build a strategy that's solving for many, and then you have that platform to talk about it and show the value, then I don't think that a CEO leaving is necessarily going to affect it because your consumers, you've already created these strategies. Your consumers are then used to it. Your employees are used to it. Marketing is seeing the brand benefits of it, it's already embedded. Um, it just gives you, I guess it's like the escalator to 
making change is by having that access to the leader rather than the leader being the hinge pin. I know we were talking about, you know, what the future holds. Uh, but one thing I would like to ask, though, is, you know, in a lot of we get a lot, a lot of our audience are always asking, oh, how do I get started? Whether it's, you know, straight out of school or they want to make a pivot in their career. So like, how would somebody get started in corporate social responsibility today um, if there's nothing, whether A, it's in a company that doesn't have one, or they're just looking to, to start? I think there's a few different starting points that I typically see. And people reach out to me on LinkedIn with similar questions around this. And so the first is someone that's in a company that doesn't have a CSR program, and they think they should. This is where you go in with a value proposition and you start to build those advocates, you make relationships. Um, people sometimes often overlook the HR business partner. This person just knows everything. Talk to them about the, the timing that you should pitch this. Um, I believe that we actually have a five-step um, how to build a case for change series on the Social Impact Show. So I would recommend listening to that. Um, if you're not in a company and you want to be on one of the CSR teams, I say you should... CSR people typically are pretty receptive. Just message people on LinkedIn, start asking questions um, and, and make sure that you are sort of walking the talk. So are you already engaged in these types of programs? Um, are you on say a, a board for a not for profit? That type of stuff matters. And then if you're a student who is thinking about, okay, what do I need to do to actually break into this? The tricky thing is there's not a whole lot of CSR degrees out there. There's more than there was when I was um, in university. Uh, there's definitely more sustainability. So you could maybe add a master's or something like that in some form of social impact that gives you a leg up. But I think that the real opportunity here, though, is the relationships that you're building within those companies. So I say, you know, if you are so desperate to be a social impact practitioner, why don't you just get into these companies, take a role that's parallel, so it could be within marketing or it could be within HR, and then start building those relationships, start doing the work, um, and then bridge over into the social impact teams. It's tough to break in um, and their roles are very, very sparse. So you have to be a little bit creative about the ways that you're doing it. The other thing that I might recommend too is um, I, I also am very passionate about behavioral science and my partner, um, business partner, she's a, a social data scientist. And that's another avenue that you can get in because you're thinking about human behaviors, you're thinking about how people make decisions, and then building programs that can surround around positive um, decision making. So it doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, a direct line between CSR and here you go. There are a lot of parallel functions that you can just be creative about and um, find your way in. I don't know if that helps. It's it's a tough one. For anybody looking, just what you said would definitely make sense because it's it's just maybe a foot in the door or a phone call or a a DM or a or a message or or whatever a connection request away um, to 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 actually getting into the position or the company that you want that you want to um, be part of. So, um, and I guess like you know, as we close off going into the new year, where do you think the the CSR professional is going to be going? Um, you know, whether it's in the next two, three, five years? I think it's going to change a lot depending on where ESG takes us as well. So uh, unfortunately, with specific standards that exist that could be really good. And so I'll step back. So ESG is a, a set of like standards that companies need to think about um, in the way that they run their company. And it's around environmental, it's around like, social, and it's around governance. Um, and so the way they show up, the way they think that they think about the work that they do. And it's essentially this index that makes um, companies and look more desirable to investors and kind of follow these steps. And so with this these new set of standards, there's going to be companies that need to follow suit or believe they need to follow suit. And then that puts in CSR people in kind of an awkward position because you might not be a data anal analyst already. Um, this might be a huger scope than you signed up for and why you signed up for this work. And so I think that there might be a, uh, there might be a bit of a, 
I don't know what the right word is, but a discomfort around who else needs to be hired and what that role is going to look like going forward if it's more compliance based. I'm I love the idea of ESG in theory, but I'm afraid that it might lose sight of some of the good work that people should be doing for the right reasons. And so um, I'm, I'm interested to see what happens there. And then in terms of what's going what's next, I feel like um these roles are no longer just program management roles. They they are incredibly strategic. And as I mentioned, you know, the expectations of these consumers and employees about how authentic and how purpose-filled and how, um, you know, socially driven the companies that they buy from and work for are, this is going to, I guess, increase the responsibility and expectation of social impact leaders to do really good things. So the the roles I think are going to require some more um, expertise in business and strategy and all of those like broader business um, elements. I would say that's that's maybe what's next for social impact professionals. I know we could be talking about future trends for a long time, but if anybody wanted to connect with you, Nicole, what's the best place to reach you? Yeah, um, you can email me at nmcphail, maybe we can pop this up, at darwininc.org. Um, and then we have a website at darwinpivot.com. So you can find us in either of those places. Or hit me up on LinkedIn, Nicole McBail. Watch here for part two of our series on the future of corporate social responsibility, and check out this playlist to learn how to build an in-depth CSR strategy. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch your next episode.